D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. Many people in America talk about freedom today, but what if the freedom they're speaking of is actually a form of slavery? Our founding fathers very, made it very clear that they said we hold to these truths given by our Creator includes certain inalienable rights. Rights come from God, that's how they understood it. They don't come from government. The revolutionaries on our streets and in our institutions today are working to destroy true freedom. Find out how on today's Truths That Transform. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. As the old adage goes, those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. When many people think of history, their eyes glaze over with memories of some dull class from high school. But history is where we find the people and the ideas that control our world today, even hundreds or thousands of years after they lived. Did you know that much of the turmoil that we see in the streets of American cities today can be traced straight back to a revolution that took place in the 1700s? On today's program, you will see how that event directly undermines the nation you live in today. You will discover how far it diverges from the Christian foundation that gave us freedom and prosperity. And we will show you some amazing resources to help you combat its false and dangerous ideas. Charles Dickens wrote his classic, A Tale of Two Cities, partly to express his concerns about the French Revolution. Today, we consider the tale of two revolutions, the American Revolution in 1776 and the French Revolution in 1789. These two events could not have been more different in almost every respect. And here is the key. Those fostering upheaval here in America are the ideological descendants of France's bloody and godless revolution, not America's. Yet all this is no mere historical footnote. Our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb has more. On April 15, 2019, the historic Notre Dame Cathedral, built in 1163, caught fire, causing severe damage to much of the structure. But this wasn't the first time Notre Dame came under assault. It also was attacked in 1793 during the French Revolution. They took a, a famous French actress, dressed her up as the goddess of reason, took her into Notre Dame Cathedral, put her on the altar, and worshipped her. The French Revolution that began in 1789 initially may have seemed similar to our revolution, which began in 1775 with the shot heard round the world. But the similarities are only superficial. It uh, degenerated into a horrible bloodbath in the reign of terror and the French Revolution um, brought about modern dictatorship. Um, and that, that has been the contrast that's been going on in, in the societies of the world ever since between the American Revolution, which is based upon absolutes that are given to us by God, and the French Revolution, which are just you know, rights because man asserts them, which has proved to be an insufficient foundation upon which to build a society that guarantees freedom. Critics note that the big difference between the French Revolution and the American Revolution is quite simple. The American upheaval was pro-God. The French one was anti-God. Well, you know, if you look at the American Revolution and then you contrast it with the French Revolution, which took place just a little over a decade later, um, you could not have a bigger contrast. Um, the Declaration of Independence, which is our sine qua non, says all, all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, the French Revolution said, we believe in liberty, equality, fraternity. 
the Declaration of the Rights of Man based on an assertion. That's it. Uh, the French Revolution was very anti-God. Um, they uh, renamed the days of the week. When Napoleon crowned himself emperor, he didn't crown himself king, he crowned himself emperor because he was trying to go back to the Roman Empire before Christianity. There is no leftist who is for liberty. They believe in equality, and equality trumps liberty. You can't have both as your primary vehicle. The French Revolution was schizophrenic. That's why it produced guillotines, because it had equality as one of its three virtues, liberty, equality, fraternity. We didn't have equality as one of ours. We were, we were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, e pluribus unum, and God we trust, and liberty. That's what we believe in. The French Revolution began to consume itself. By the time it ended, about a decade later, approximately 40,000 Frenchmen had been beheaded by the guillotine, including the King and Queen of France, and many Catholic leaders, priests, and nuns. The French, they, they, threw, they threw religion and Christianity to the wind, and it was, it was anarchy. And of course, when anarchy takes place, someone comes in to, to, to fill the vacuum of order and then you had despots. I mean, so much so you, uh, Robespierre, you know, called the you know the voice of virtue. I mean, the revolution ended up consuming even him. In contrast, the founders of America emphasized the rule of law, based ultimately on God's law. This is apparent through the founding fathers' reliance on Christian sources for their political reasoning. There have been studies that have been uh, done to that look at uh, the influences that the founders drew on in their political writings. And, and these studies show that the Bible is by far uh, the source they turn to most frequently, uh, much more than uh, a Locke or a Montesquieu. Outside of the Bible, one of the sources the Founding Fathers quoted the most was Sir William Blackstone, who was cited by American leaders during the Founding Era more times than anyone else, except the Scriptures and Montesquieu. Phrases in our founding documents, like the laws of nature and of nature's God, come directly from Blackstone. These founders of America were reading Blackstone's biblical worldview that said that all law came from God, and if any law was contrary to God's law, it was not law at all. This is what our founding fathers were reading. And Blackstone had such a profound impact in America that he is justified in being calling, called the source of the philosophy of America in the Declaration of Independence. In other words, the Founding Fathers were trying to get the King of England and the leaders in Parliament to follow the rule of law, which they were violating. Our Founding Fathers very, made it very clear that they said we hold to these truths given by our Creator includes certain inalienable rights. Rights come from God, that's how they understood it. They don't come from government, not true rights. Now there's all kinds of things people want to add to that, but uh, and I think are suspect, not truly rights. They might be preferences, but, uh, but the government's job is to protect rights. What God has given to every human being, certain fundamental uh, freedoms that the government is there to, to protect. I think our founding fathers wanted and expected and believed that religion would flourish under the system that they created. They created a pragmatic but principled government through the Constitution. I mean, they traded royalty for representation. They certainly did not prescribe a state religion in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, but I think they expected that freedom of worship would lead to religion flourishing. Well, the French Revolution, which I'm always attacking, only lasted 10 years. 1789 to 1799, and then Napoleon came and said, the revolution is over. So we're not talking about France or Paris today, but like a volcanic explosion, the lava flow has come out ever since. In the 19th century, it was revolutionary nationalism. In France, Italy, Greece, and so on. The 20th century one is more obvious, although it began in the 19th, which is revolutionary socialism, or one word, communism, and the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution in 1949. What we're talking about is the third lava flow, 
cultural Marxism, sometimes called neo-Marxism. Dr. Oz Guinness points out that the spirit of the anti-God French Revolution lives on today in various forms of neo-Marxism. People are shocked today by things like the cancel culture or speech codes or whatever. They are merely the fruit of this thinking since the 1920s. But critical race theory, which everyone's talking about now, is actually only one part of it. You've got critical women's studies, you've got queer studies, you've got fat studies and all sorts of things. But the key thing is it is totally different from the American experiment and the American Revolution. Those who founded America were not actually revolutionaries. Revolutions seek to overturn the existing order and inaugurate some new order, usually some unworkable utopia that becomes a nightmare. In America, however, the founders wished to return the colonies to the just constitutional rule and liberty that they had always enjoyed as Englishmen and that was being increasingly denied them by the king. In their break from Great Britain, they established a nation on those traditional biblical principles that had virtually created Western civilization and all of its benefits and advances. That foundation is under attack today by true revolutionaries who want to turn America into a socialist, secular utopia. Dr. D. James Kennedy calls us back to our true foundations in this portion of his message, America, a Christian nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And the Bible asks, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? There is no doubt that this is indeed a nation which was built upon the foundation of God, that the Lord indeed was the God of this nation, that it was founded upon the principles of God's word, upon the teachings of Christianity, and for the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. All of that is under enormous attack and has been for the last few decades. In fact, so effective has been that attack that the historical revisionists have all but removed every vestige of our Christian heritage from our textbooks in school. You and I were born in a Christian nation that may not be said for your children or grandchildren unless we who have received this marvelous patrimony do something other than let it sift through our fingers like sand because we are engaged simply in personal peace and prosperity, as Dr. Francis Schaeffer used to say. My subject is America, a Christian nation. That is a concept which has been so systematically blotted from the collective memory of this country as to sound in the ears of most people in America to be an alien philosophy, an intrusion of religion into the tranquility of a secular country. There are those in our country today who are busily tearing apart that foundation who would gnash their teeth at the idea that this is a Christian nation and will not be satisfied until they have removed every vestige of our Christian heritage from not only the mines but the monuments of this country. But let's go back to the beginning, to those intrepid pilgrims that set sail from Holland to come to this country after fleeing their native England 12 years before. Their governor for 30 more or more years was, of course, William Bradford, who gives us the only history of that period. And before they set sail from Holland, 
he described their motives in coming. He said they had, quote, a great hope and inward zeal of laying some good foundation or at least to make some way thereunto for the propagating and advancing of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, though they should be but even a stepping stone unto others for the performing of so great a work. That is why they came, said their governor. They came for the propagating and advancing of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ. And after a fearful journey of 66 days without ever being allowed up onto the deck of the Mayflower because of the great gales and storms, they at last sighted the inhospitable shores of a winter New England coast. They harbored there in the bay and before going ashore, they met in the captain's cabin and wrote the first contract of government, or as they would call a covenant, the first constitution of America. Its birth certificate, as it is called, we call it the Mayflower Compact. It begins with these words, in the name of God, amen. That's where America began. And it goes on to say, quote, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. And so, they themselves here officially declare and sign that which their governor had said about them before they left Holland, that they came for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's how America began. Ah, but there are those who don't like to hear that. And surely that must have ended with those first pilgrims. But my friends, it did not. When finally the New England settlements at last got together and they formed their first bond in what is known as the New England Confederation, they said in that that we all came to these parts of America for one and the same end and aim to advance the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. One and all, they came for that end, they declared in the New England Confederation. The documentary evidence is voluminous. It would take hours even to quote it. It was thoroughly studied by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1892. And they gave us what is known then as the Trinity decision. And in that, the Supreme Court of the United States declared, quote, these references add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a religious people, this is a Christian nation. That is where this nation began. That is the place from which we came. And we are engaged indeed in a great struggle, testing whether this nation or any nation that believes that men were created by a divine creator and thus endowed with inalienable rights, whether such a nation can long endure. There were in the beginning and there are today those who believe that this which we have received as our patrimony, a nation of freedom and liberty and only where the Spirit of God is, is there liberty. Those that have been willing to fight and to die for such a country. And if a nation is built on such exalted principles as these, 
if it was created for such noble purposes as the advancement for the kingdom of the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the glory of God, then indeed such, such a nation deserves our sacrifice and our support. America, a Christian nation, demands an equal sacrifice from each of us. The division between the largely Christian founders who led the American War for Independence and the radicals who led the French Revolution is stark. And it's still a chasm at the center of our politics even today, where the founding fathers built the nation on biblical principles with God as the founder of our rights and liberties. The new revolutionaries want to expunge God from public life and establish a nation upon an ever-changing concept of human morality, which today includes the killing of the unborn and forcing women to share restrooms with men who decide to identify as female. They seek to abolish the police and tear down our history as though they were the Taliban marauding through a temple. If we're going to reclaim freedom for our children and grandchildren, it's absolutely vital to understand the fundamental ideas behind America's founding and the danger of replacing them with godless secularism. Nothing could be more helpful to that end than our new DVD program, The Foundation of Freedom, a conversation with Oz Guinness. And we would like to send it to you as our thanks for your generous donation to defend freedom and reach America with the truth of God's word. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339 or call toll-free 877-962-7677 or go online to djkm.org. Oz Guinness is one of the most insightful social critics of our time. And in this wide-ranging discussion with me, he brings his vast Christian intellect forward to explain two different spirits at work in the French and American revolutions and how they affect us today. It will enlighten and even shock you to discover how closely events in America today are tied to the heirs of these two incompatible movements. Contact us right away to receive the Foundation of Freedom, a conversation with Oz Guinness. And if you're able to give a generous donation of $60 or more, we will send you the DVD plus Oz Guinness's brand new hardcover book, Magna Carta for Humanity, Sinai's Revolutionary Faith and the Future of Freedom. In this book, Oz explains that we have been given a choice between the faith-filled revolution that finds its origin at Mount Sinai or the godless, bloody revolution of France, and that we must choose between faith in God and faith in reason alone, between freedom and between despotism, and between life and death. I truly believe that this is the most important book released this year, and I want to send you a new hardcover copy of it, along with the DVD, The Foundation of Freedom, a conversation with Oz Guinness as our thanks for your generous donation of $60 or more. Or we will send you the DVD alone as thanks for your generous ministry gift. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll free 877-962-7677. Or go online to djkm.org. Not long ago, actress and pop singer Demi Lovato publicly announced that she now considered herself to be 
non-binary when it comes to gender, and that she was changing her pronouns to they and their. Lapdog news outlets like CBS and CNN immediately jumped on board, writing nonsensical headlines like this one. Demi Lovato says they are non-binary and are changing their pronouns. Within hours, her entire 9,000-word Wikipedia entry had been duly rewritten in the nonsensical newspeak of they and them referring to this one individual woman. Now listen, we of all people should have compassion for this confused and troubled individual, but this is not some trivial distraction. Language functions at the center of a society. As George Orwell once said, our language becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness of our language makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. And my, oh my, what foolish thoughts we see on display here. Jesus instructs his followers that when making promises, they should simply say yes or no. Those small words have enormous meaning. And Jesus does not say, let your yes be fluid, changing with the shifting morals of an evolving culture. Ours is a curious time when a young woman can publicly declare herself to be they, and if you refer to her as the her she was just a few hours before, the cancel culture and thought police may be at your door. Why? Because they understand the power of language to control, and they will enforce this new ideology with penalties. Their goal is to render us into a mass of undifferentiated, indistinct, and easily controllable mush heads. At the end of the day, words do matter, even the tiniest of pronouns. We are commanded by God not to bear false witness, meaning that all of our words must communicate truth. Calling a confused actress they does not communicate truth. And candidly, it does her no favors, but rather encourages her confusion. Instead, it denies the very imprint of God upon her, who in the garden made Adam and Eve, male and female. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. I'm Frank Wright, thanks for being with us. And here's a look at the next truths that transform. It's incredibly problematic when there are efforts presented to completely revise history. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.